David Singer may have busted in the first round of the NBC Heads Up Poker Championship, but he traded that potential $500,000 win for a $560,000 win when he took down the $25,000 buy-in Full Tilt Heads Up Championship this Sunday. Singer is no newcomer to Heads Up Poker. He took down the Heads Up event in the 2006 Mirage Poker Showdown as well, earning more than $230,000. Singer, a former environmental lawyer, has also proven himself as a poker renaissance man by making the final table of the $50,000 buy-in World Series of Poker Horse Championship event twice in a row. He came in sixth place both times, actually. His biggest ever win was for $1 million for taking down the Caesars Palace Classic main event last October. Now, we have David here in the room right now to talk about his recent heads-up win. Well, thanks for being here with us today, David. Sure, it's my pleasure. So, first off, let's kind of differentiate between the NBC Heads Up uh, Poker Championship, which you recently took part in, and the Full Tilt Poker Championship, which you recently won. So, how different were the fields in both events and the structures themselves as well? Uh, the fields are pretty similar. Most of the better players in poker were playing Full Tilt, I guess. Uh, there are more celebrities in the uh, NBC, obviously, and... Uh, most of the really good players are playing, the th or the well-known players, anyway. Uh, and Full Tilt is not just well-known players, but it was a lot of the top players, a lot of the top cash game players on there. So I'd say the fields are pretty comparable, maybe, maybe even a little softer in the NBC. And, of course, I'm going to say better things about Full Tilt, the Full <laughs> Tilt one, because <laughs> I won it. But honestly, uh, <clears throat> I was kind of disappointed. I had wanted to get invited to the NBC tournament for a while, and I was invited this year. And uh, I was disappointed in the structure, but it was just explained to me, you know, Maury, who runs it, is a sharp guy. He knows the structure isn't that good at the beginning for favoring, uh, um, I don't know, skillful play at the beginning. But he's got time constraints for TV, so he's got to make that concession. Then I guess as you go on through the tournament in NBC, uh, there gets to be more play. On Full Tilt, there was a great amount of play. I thought it was a really good structure because I won, but <laughs> yeah. no, but there was a lot of play, and some, one of my matches lasted, I think, over two hours, maybe two and a half hours. Which um, is unheard of for something like the NBC Heads Up. Yeah, it's unheard of for that. Uh, a couple of years ago, I won a Heads Up tournament at the Mirage, and it was the same thing. Uh, the tournament, it was best two out of three, and the tournaments went for a long time. And Just the final was best two out of three, or every single no, match? No, every match was best okay. two out of three, and in fact, for a couple of them, I feel like I didn't even show up, and I lost the first match very quickly, and then I came for three of them, I think, out of the, and I ended up winning, and uh, so it made a big difference to me, but I, I, I really enjoy it when there's a lot more play and heads up, I think, it's well, more skillful. And you were talking about how the structure in NBC had to be shorter just out of necessity because it's being filmed for TV, but on the other hand you can edit whatever you want out when it's on TV. So where is the time constraint really? Well, I made that argument myself to a few <laughs> people. I agree with you. But I guess the way they wanted to show it was, for some reason, I don't know, maybe they don't want to pay the, you know, I like Maury, I don't want to say anything bad about it, but maybe just financial constraints, they don't want to pay the crew for that long. I don't know the ins and outs of it. But I know ideally, as a player, most of us want to see more play and, slower the blinds going up more slowly okay well and let's get to a definitive answer then which field was tougher in your opinion uh i really hadn't given it too much thought i'd say at least half the players were the same in both of them um, yeah exactly there was all, a lot of repeat customers yeah between certainly the all the really well-known full tilt pros were in both of them um i don't know i'd say Probably the full tilt tournament was tougher, but actually there are some non-full tilt players who were some of the top players who maybe didn't play in the tournament. I'd say they're probably comparable. I don't know. Okay. But but there definitely there were definitely weaker spots in the overall. It might have been comparable, but there are definitely weaker spots in the NBC tournament because some like I don't know, Oral Horsheiser, Jason um, Alexander. I'm sure that you know they could play somewhat, but they're not going to be as tough as even some like the last two guys I played are young kids who play on the internet, very high stakes. They, they always play heads up, no limit. They're going to be tougher than some unknown celebrity that's playing, you know. Even Don Cheadle, he's played some, but I don't know how high a level he's, he plays. I, I, you know, I don't have first-hand knowledge of it. And there are also other pros who, for various reasons, have done a good job of marketing themselves <laughs> and uh, get invited to 
most things having to do with poker and which maybe, doesn't necessarily correlate with their skill is what you're saying right yeah maybe then <laughs> maybe they're not that skillful but for some quirk or another they're they're well known well theoretically your final match in the full tilt heads up championship that you just played in should have been your toughest because you had both won five straight matches to get to this six your heads up match was against emil white line patel was it your hardest match or did you have a harder match before that uh, a lot of people have asked me that. I'd say the hardest match was probably the, the first match I had. Um, I don't who even that know against? the guy's name, but his online name is OMG Clay Aiken. It's a Phil Galfond. And I know he plays uh, the highest no-limit cash games on full tilt, and I know he's probably one of the biggest. He's supposed to be one of the biggest winners on the site. And he, I'd say he was my toughest opponent. And why so? Um, he makes things up more and... He kept me off balance. Some of the other guys sort of came out with one, played one style, or then they took a while to adjust, and I sort of saw how they were adjusting. A few of them came out wanting to, uh, which is, they came out with a style that's pretty common among young, successful Internet players, and they were just trying to run me over. And uh, I think I'm good at playing against people who come out with just that that mindset they're going to run me over. I think I know how to counter it pretty well. Well, how do you counter it? Are well, you going to be able to give away your secret? <laughs> you trap them, and you, then you, uh, when they come over the top of you, you got to come over the top of them sometimes even without a hand, you know? I don't want to give away all my secrets. The, uh, <laughs> the World Series heads-up tournament's coming up soon. But, I mean, any, I find any style of play. I try not to have a style myself and no limit. I try to uh, just anticipate what my opponent is doing and counter the strategy. So if if someone comes out with one set strategy and it doesn't seem like they they're varying their play that much, no matter what the strategy is, if you're uh, if you're thinking, you can take advantage of it, you know. Okay. And then some some people were a little bit predictable. They'd come out with one strategy and then they'd see that wasn't working, and then they'd switch. And I think I would pick up on when they would when when they would switch. You know, the obviously the better players in poker are constantly changing gears and. Uh, in their style. Okay. So when you're playing heads up, are you playing the player more than the cards when compared to a full ring game? Um, obviously, it's a mixture of both, but I think in heads up, you're playing the player more because you're seeing so many hands against the person that you, you should be picking up on how they play certain hands and what they're likely. You, you get a much more of a feel on what they're likely to have if, you're, if the structure is good and you're playing a lot of hands against them. So you sort of know when you can take them off a hand, when they just have a medium hand, and you know how they're going to play a strong hand mostly. Not that you don't make mistakes, but you should be getting a lot more of an idea of how the player is going to play, um, how they're going to play their hands in different situations. And so I think the cards become less important. Okay. Well, given that, is it easier to play heads up live than online then because you have the physical tells and more of a sense based on the atmosphere of how he's playing? I guess it is. I mean, depending on how well, how well you pick up on physical tells, theoretically your opponent could pick on them, pick up on them as, as well as you can, you know? Um, sometimes I feel like I'm good at tell, picking up tells, but mostly with, uh, with more experienced players, um, I don't pick up that many tells these days. With, with newer players who haven't played that long, aren't experienced, or mostly play on the Internet, I find I'm more likely to be able to find something that's worthwhile if I if I try and concentrate on them. Well, do you kind of put physical tells as like the last resort, or I mean the last line of defense for when you play hands then at this point? If I'm playing live? If you're playing live. Uh, I don't really categor categorize things in poker like that. Maybe I should think about it more, and, and uh, I should be like that, but I guess I'm someone who just plays more by feel, and... Uh, I don't say I'm going to look for this, this, and this. Actually, the last tournament, when I really tried to concentrate on uh, picking up physical tells, I made two terrible reads, and I got knocked out <laughs> got knocked out quickly. The last one, the guy was shaking a lot, and it's kind of a classic sign of someone holding a big hand, but for some reason I thought he was uh, just nervous and pulling a big bluff on me, and uh, I called him, and he had the nuts, so <laughs> it didn't work out too well. So uh, I don't know. It varies. Uh, different opponents, I'm going to do different things, but it's just uh, more of a feel thing of what what the person's playing like on that day and whether I think they're a sophisticated player who's going to be acting or not.
Okay. Well, when you're playing online, then, what tricks do you use to kind of develop a blueprint for your opponent? I wouldn't say they're tricks. I mean, I just pay attention as much as I can, which actually online is a problem for me in cash games. I'm really bad at playing attention. I'm often I'm like I was playing online last night and watching a movie. It's, it's not, <laughs> I wouldn't recommend it. It doesn't usually uh, work out that well. Paying $25,000 for a buy-in, though, will usually focus your attention on a tournament. Yeah, <laughs> I was buy-in. focused on that. Um, I don't know. I don't really have a, a formula for it. I just uh, try and think of what the my opponent's general strategy is and figure out how I'm going to counter it, basically. Well, you know? what I meant, though, is what kind of things are you looking for when, when you're playing? Like, what kind of signs are you looking for to keep well, you in on what kind of strategy you're playing? Well, to take it playing? extreme, like, a couple of these guys came out and they raised, like, three or three and a half times the big blind the first, I don't know, four or five times they had the button and then bet the flop, and then if I bet, they raised me. So, I mean, it's pretty obvious that they don't have aces every time, so then there looks like they're you know, being hyper aggressive. So then I'm going to play, you know, I'm going to counter that strategy. And if, uh, you know, I mean, it's not, it's not rocket science, but you're just trying to figure out what they're doing and, and figure out the anecdote for it. Okay. Well, do you think that heads up poker requires more skill than a full ring game? Um, certainly different skills. Um, I'd say on on some level. You know, there's all kinds of ways to be successful at poker. As you know, you can sit home and make money playing $1, $2, no limit. You can play all the big events at the World Series. There are niches for everyone. Um, And it's probably more just a different skill set than uh, necessarily tougher to play heads up. Well, I I guess what I mean is, does it take a, a more finely tuned person to be able to play heads up well than it would to play for a person to play a game with a full ring because a lot of people argue that when you're playing at a full table it's a lot more mechanical because your decisions are a little bit easier because you have more information and because you've seen the situations a lot more often whereas playing against the player you have to you have to have more innate skills to be able to do it. And that's the argument in favor of heads up being more skillful. Yeah, I would agree it's somewhat more skillful. Um, but um, you could you could definitely be good at one and not the other. You could be good at heads up play and not be good in a ring. So it's definitely different skills, but in some ways it's more skillful, sure. Okay. Well, you're a very environmentally minded, charity oriented kind of person. Uh, based on your shirt, for instance. <laughs> and so in light of your recent win, what are your plans in, as far as those areas are concerned? I plan to stop global warming on my <laughs> Single-handedly? <laughs> Single-handedly, yeah. By showing uh, inconvenient truth to as many people as possible. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Uh, well, I'm involved with this charity, akuproject.org. Um, it's, uh, the goal is to bring uh, an education center um, to a very small, poor town in Nigeria called Aku. And uh, there's no money taken out for administration. It's a really good charity, and it helps a lot of people. And uh, once it, once uh, there's an education center in this town, then um, the idea is to spread out and do other towns. And the basic premise of it is to empower power people, educate them, and then they can take care of themselves better and teach other people and just raise the whole standard of living uh, in the area, in Nigeria. And the reason I'm involved with it is my cousin's... Um, when they were younger, took in an exchange student from this town in Nigeria, and he's like a, a brother to them. And he um, recently started this charity to go give back and help his village. So my two of my cousins are uh, two of the administrators, and no one in America or Nigeria who manages the charity takes money out. So it's a really good cause. Well, and that's a really big deal because most of the big-name charities out there their administrators, like their CEOs, for instance, are easily getting six-figure salaries. Right. Yeah. And that's taking a huge amount from the bottom line of the charity itself. Right, right. So if the administration is not getting any money, that really is a huge deal. Yeah, so if you give here, it's kind of like they take no rake out. <laughs> <laughs> a no rake charity. <laughs> who, who can't get in line with that? Right? <laughs> that's right. And as far as environmentally, um, I, I have been lagging on doing it, but I was trying to get, uh, get some association with an environmental organization, maybe to wear a logo for them during the World Series. Um, I feel like I should be doing more. Uh, I used to work uh, as an environmental lawyer, and uh, that's uh, I'm very interested in environmental causes, but I should do more with poker, I guess, okay. and the environment.
Well, uh, to switch topics right now, you are easily one of the most well-rounded poker players out there, as evidenced by your two final tables in a row at the $50,000 World Series of Poker Horse Championship. How did you go about becoming so well-versed in the poker variants? Well, I think in general, people who have played poker longer, uh, they've picked up other games and play a lot of the games, whereas most of the people who are learning now just focus on no limit. So it's just natural that uh, I know some more of those games. I started out when I, the first five years I played, I, I just played uh, stud exclusively. So then uh, picking up uh, eight or better stud and res was natural along the way. Um, I'm still not as good as I should be at the flop games for sure. But... Um, that's weird for a lot of people to hear. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's surprising to people who don't play um, poker that much that everyone who's a professional is not good at every game. <laughs> um, that's just the way it is. If you play in a horse game, um, especially if you're not at the highest level, you can find that some of the people just are much weaker at one game than the other. And uh, since there are three stud games in the uh, horse at the World Series, I think maybe that helps me more than more than people who are just better better at the flop games. Like there was a guy uh, like Kenny Tran last year made the final table of the horse, and uh, he hardly ever plays stud. I think he, he'd admit they're not his best games. And so uh, even though he ended up finishing higher than me, I think uh, he was giving up a lot in the stud games. And there are a lot of people like that who mo play more flop games, so I think that's helped me some. Well, what's the hardest game to learn? I don't know. For me, the hardest game to learn well is limit hold'em, I guess. Why Which is that? people say is easy. I don't know. It just doesn't click with me. I haven't really put <laughs> enough effort into playing it or enough time into playing it by itself. Okay. Well, as far as stud is concerned, I mean, that's a game of, it just has a wealth of information because there are so many cards that are turned face up. So theoretically, it should be easier to play because you have so much more information. But it becomes really overwhelming for people because they kind of feel like they have to see everything and remember everything that they see. So do you have any advice for people to kind of get acclimated to the stud games? Well, once you play, if you play stud, uh, if, you, if you were to give uh, a month or two to just playing stud, if you're a professional player or play a lot, you'd find uh, that it would become pretty secondary to remember the cards. Once you play for a while, that's not even an issue. You could come up to me when I'm playing stud and talk to me, and if, even if I'm not in the hand, there's a good chance I'll have seen all the cards out and remember them. It's just uh, um, it's like anything else. The more you work at it, the better it gets. Any, I don't know anyone who's done practice working on their memory finds they can, if they try a lot, it's like a muscle, their memory, that they'll remember more things. So after a while, you just end up remembering the cards and stud. The way I started doing it was uh, from the first book I ever read about it, a book by Roy West it's called something like 42 Lessons in Stud. And he said, just remember the cards in the order, like, Remember how many the deuces that come out, and the threes, and the fours, and just keep that in your head. Okay. So, it's just but once once you play for a while, it's not even you don't even worry about it. it. Just comes naturally remembering the cards. Right. Well, there was kind of a lot of hullabaloo about the first two years of the horse championship about the structure in it. The first year it had really long days because they didn't schedule it for enough days, and the second year I heard that towards the end it kind of became a little bit of a crapshoot. What What are your thoughts on that? Is that how it was? Yeah, that's how it was. The structure could have been much better last year down um, when we got down <clears throat> to two tables and especially the final table. Um, I went with a little bit under average stack to the final table, and I just lost one hand basically, and then I had no chips. So it shouldn't be like that. The year before, there was a lot more play. Even though the, in uh, 2006, they made us play 19 hours straight and then come back with not that much rest and play play uh, the final table, which a lot of us were sort of in a daze during the final table, not to make an excuse, but um, I think that's better. Obviously, we're paying $50,000. It's the biggest buy-in. I'd rather see more play, and if they have to add a day to it than what happened last year, where uh, I felt like there was a much easier field down near the end last year, and uh, I thought I'd have a better chance, but then just I lost one Raz hand I got unlucky in, and that pretty much did me in at the final table, so shouldn't really be like that in a huge buy-in <laughs> tournament. Well, you'd hope not. Now, I would assume that because they're kind of marketing it as one of their big flagship events, that they might pay more attention to fine-tuning those aspects of it this year, hopefully. so. 
Well, I hope so, but they say every year that they're going to do a lot better, even with the cards. The cards seem like they're a problem almost every year. And they, <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. I can't imagine why that should be so tough to get right, but somehow it is. Well, what are your plans for this year's World Series? I mean, it's right around the corner. I'm pl going to play a lot of events, hopefully. I'm expecting a baby any, any time now. So uh, I don't know how that will affect how much I can play. Um, but... Uh, if all things go well, I'm going to play maybe like 25 events or something like that. I What's the due date? The due date is uh, June 7th. It's actually an interesting story having to do with the uh, Heads Up tournament. <laughs> I didn't want to... Uh, it was a tournament where you weren't allowed to unregister for. Right. But uh, I got special permission to register for it. And then uh, if there was a problem with the or, or if the baby came, I could unregister and so they weren't left without 64 players. I had someone lined up to play for me. So uh, another pro was going to take my place. So the morning of uh, the tournament, um, I thought my fiancée might be going into labor. All right, now, I didn't think she was going into labor, but I just had a feeling that it was going to happen that day. <laughs> so I, I pretty much had decided not to play, and I called the guy who was going to play for me, and I told him... Uh, Probably he would play. And then my fiancé talked me into playing at the last minute. So that <laughs> worked good, out. Very yeah, It's more interesting, too. The, uh, we had uh, a Lamaze class that we've been going to, and it just ended last week. And um, she didn't, I wanted to invite all the people over for sort of a graduation party, if you will. <laughs> and uh, she, uh, we didn't know the people that well, so she was a little uncomfortable hosting it. So it was pretty much me making it happen and she was kind of iffy about whether we should do it not that she didn't like the people but she just was uncomfortable hosting everyone and then uh um it was for sunday the tournament started on saturday the heads up tournament and uh i thought it was a one-day tournament i didn't know it went till sunday <laughs> so then i made the final four then the tournament started at one and the party was for two <laughs> so here here here's my fiance she was like feeling a little funny about uh hosting the party the first place. <laughs> and then she's hosting the whole party by herself <laughs> so when i won i went downstairs and there was already a party in my house so she had a good excuse <laughs> <laughs> there was a lot of pressure to win with people waiting to celebrate yeah seriously well what, what what event are you looking forward to most of the world series uh i don't know i guess i'd like to do well on the horse the main event all the big ones i'm happy to do well the, again in the horse there's a ten thousand dollar stud tournament this year i consider stud my best game so i'd like to do well at that I think I made the, I couldn't play it last year, but I think the year before I made uh, the final two tables and was disappointed, so I wouldn't mind taking that down. If I took down the, the $10,000 stud, the horse, and the main event, I'd be happy. Just those three? Yeah, just those three. Not too lofty. <laughs> well, that's all the questions I got. I really appreciate you coming in to do this interview. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you. And thank you guys for watching the Online Zone on Card Player TV.